you guys enjoy the music during the, I almost said halftime, intermission? They're pretty wonderful. Um, I hadn't heard them before. Dan Do. They're going to be here afterwards as well. So if you feel like staying around, chatting, meeting some new people, talking about all of our phenomenal presentations, we would love to have you stay here. And you can watch me drink even more beer when I'm not on stage. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. So the next person to welcome us back to our second half is Kyle Shannon. Um, yeah, woo! Uh, Kyle's great. Um, I thought he, he reminded me kind of of Kevin Smith the first time that I met him. He's an amazing storyteller. He was one of the starters for agency.com back in 95. Apparently it's a big deal. I don't understand technology. Um, he, he did say one of the things that he's most grateful for, and I don't remember any of the words except the last one, his kind and loving, and I believe, well, I know he said saucy wife. So uh, give it up for the saucy wife. And may I have a big round of applause, please, for Kyle. Hello, storytellers. Yeah. We're all storytellers. Well, we were all storytellers. See, storytelling is a lost art, which is weird because for millions of years, storytelling was a core part of who we were. It was a core part of human existence. Without storytelling, you didn't know where the food was or how to keep the fire going. Storytelling is what created culture, and as we get to the 19th century, it becomes currency in society, the great age of letter writing. What also happened in the 19th century, the 1800s, the real revolution. And what gets of things that are really powerful for storytelling, cinema, photography, telephony. And some of this stuff seemed kind of pointless at the time. This is a film called George Ott's Sneeze. And you would pay a nickel to go into a Nickelodeon to watch George Ott sneeze. That was entertainment. <laughs> and yet, in the century, in the five generations from 1890 to 1990, we transformed from storytellers as a core part of who we are to story consumers. We started consuming stories. We started letting other people tell our stories in remarkable ways. And we watched. And over five generations, the skills and the power of storytelling slowly drifted out of the core of our being and, and what we needed to live in society. So what did we lose from that? Well, we lost the ability to tell the difference between talking and So when someone rambles on a lot and you're like, could you stop? It's not storytelling. <laughs> you know, they don't know story structure. But here we are, as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. We just turned the new millennium. There's all these interesting technologies coming on. I'd like to take us on a little journey, a little technology journey, starting when I was a kid in junior high. And in the 1970s, I learned to program BASIC on a Trash 80, and I had an Atari 2600, and I killed Space Invaders, and I bragged about it. And in the 1980s, Anyone remember that? But you could connect with people that knew what you knew all over, and then the 90s, the web came, and it was cool, and that was Amazon's first site, and God, was it ugly, but, you know, hey, that was a magazine that my wife and I launched in 1994. The first article written about it was written in Paris. It was cool. And it was the beginning, and then the knots. I love that phrase, the knots, because who says that? We get social media, Facebook shows up, and they make a movie about it. And then in 2007, Steve Jobs introduces the iPhone, and we see the first real smartphone, and storytelling tools go mobile. And you remember George Ott's sneeze. This was a video of a little panda bear sneezing and scaring his mommy. It got 200 million views. And it's kind of awkward right now. Like, the wife takes a lovely self-portrait. Here you go, Daddy. This isn't Dad, it's Dan, Mom. <laughs> so we're kind of figuring it out. And it's kind of painful, and it's kind of awkward, and it's kind of awesome. And we start to see within our friends and our group of friends them starting to figure it out, going from oversharing 
to kind of sharing interesting stuff. Like Scott Kirtle and my friend decided to be happy for 100 days in a, ro a row and share about it. Cool. You know, um, bento boxes that look like Muppets. That's kind of storytelling and awesome. You know, and then there's big wins, right? The Arab Spring, a bunch of really tiny stories told well in a globally connected environment. That's transformative. That's magic, right? So, so, so we've got all these tools. We don't quite know what to do with them. But we're going to transition again from story consumers back to storytellers. And how long will it take? I don't know. But what I do know is what will make it happen is if you start to take the risk of authentically sharing your story and who you are and things that make you vulnerable. If that makes you feel icky inside, it should. We're six or seven generations removed from knowing how to do this crap. But here's the deal. We're already all storytellers. We always have been, except for that one little century where we weren't. Thank you very much. I am so petrified now to walk anywhere. <laughs> How is that for a kick-ass presentation? I love it. That was amazing and, and true. Being vulnerable is hard. Um, the next guy, I have to say his name sexily because I want to. Juan Diaz de Leon. Juan. <laughs> Juan is a nerdy entrepreneur and a self-proclaimed dating expert. Uh, fun facts about Juan Diaz de Leon include uh, he likes Snapchatting, which I've never done because I'm almost 40. And, uh, and he also indicated, and I'm not making this up, he likes flexing. And, um, and, uh, and he's a huge Taylor Swift fan also. Yeah, oh, hey! And you need to give him a whole lot of love because he might be just a little bit nervous. So please, give Juan a big hand. You got it. As a single person, Dating is extremely exciting, but it can also be confusing and somewhat stressful, especially when it comes to online dating numbers. So I can throw a lot of facts and figures at you, but we only have five minutes together, so here's what you need to know. We are getting married much later in life, and we're getting many more dates before marriage. Online dating has grown tremendously. Dating apps have changed everything. We as a society are still trying to figure these things out. Now to put the spotlight on me. I've been using dating apps for quite some time but I didn't really start using them on a regular basis until after I graduated from college four years ago. However nine months ago I challenged myself to go a full year without drinking. There is an interesting backstory there, but long story short, uh, long story short, um, I, um, my dating life has changed. <laughs> it has. It certainly has. I've learned that it's, it's not as easy for me to meet women the way I used to. So what did I do? Well, you guessed it. I started using dating apps exclusively as a means to meet women. And here's what I've learned. The online dating struggle is real. Luckily, most dating apps make it easy creating a profile. You just set up your account using Facebook, set your age, gender, and distance preferences, and boom, you're instantly in a sea of romantic opportunities. But how do you do it? How do you do it? What's the best approach? How do you navigate this treacherous sea? Should you swipe right on everybody? Or should you actually take the time to craft thought out personal messages? I mean, I could say that based on my research, the most effective messages are 40 to 60 characters long, but still, 
That's not accounting for so many other things. That's such a difficult equation to think about. You have to figure in how many other messages the person got that day. You also have to figure in uh, the mood of the person at the time. And you also have to figure out what they ate for breakfast, because that matters. Now, previous generations might say, it doesn't matter what you say. If the person likes you, they like you. But for those of us that are single and dating in 2015, know that that's absolute bullshit. <laughs> now, I realized that I had no idea what was going on on the receiving end of the messages I was sent. So, I decided, I decided to reach out to every one of my old matches and ask them about their online dating experiences. And it turns out that hey and sexually aggressive messages were their least favorites. But ladies and gentlemen, here's what we have to keep in mind. We're competing with everyone with a smartphone living within 15 miles of the person. As daters, we're getting approached by all sorts of weirdos that would normally never approach us in person. But here's the thing. There's an element of digital courage. If you get shut down at a bar in public, it can be embarrassing. Get shut down um, online on a dating app, who cares? No big deal. But it's absolutely exhausting trying to be so crafty, being so, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Being so um, creative, there we go. Being so creative all the damn time. But here's the thing we have to think about. We have no social cues to go off of. So, <laughs> so it can be tough detecting the person's personality, even with emojis. But long story short, studies show that online dating, not only is it growing tremendously, but um, couples that meet online are statistically more likely to be successful. So even with all the struggles of online dating, you know, statistics do show that. But um, here's the thing we have to think about, we have to consider. Even though the struggle is real, it doesn't have to be. So my suggestion to you would be to see about a girl, see about a guy, but most of all, see about love. Thank you. You're funny. <laughs> Juan, by the way, before he came out here, he's like, hey, if I get really nervous, can I pull out my phone and read it off my phone? And I said, no. And he, he's like, are you serious? And I said, no, you can do it, but then I'll make fun of you. And now I'm making fun of him because he didn't do it, which is really not nice of me, because he did an amazing job, and I cannot even fathom how difficult it must be to date online because I can't read facial cues face to face, much less behind a computer screen. So big ups to you guys, and take advantage of this opportunity when you aren't behind a screen, perhaps by staying afterwards and listening to some great music and meeting some other singles. Hey, who here is single in the audience? Just show of hands. Yeah, y'all gotta stick around, okay. Um, the slide behind me is about ready to, I just said y'all. Um, Ready Talk, they are another one of our amazing sponsors, and they actually provided us space to do our rehearsals so we didn't suck, um, which I think is really turning out in our favor, which is great. So feel free to utilize their services. They have been fantastic. Um, and our workshops are amazing. I should mention that too. So let's say that you do submit a title for Ignite. You're like, I've got a cool idea. All right, couple things here. As the person that had never done it before, you don't have to craft your entire presentation beforehand. You just have to have a kick-ass idea and a kick-ass title, put it out there, and for God's sake, tell people to go out there and vote. Once your title has been selected, you have this huge community of people to come out 
and meet up and go through these talks together. All of the fellow presenters are in one room giving each other feedback on what makes things better and what things we better really fucking get rid of fast. Um, <laughs> we laugh because it's true. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to do and we bring beer to our meetings um, and camaraderie which is also probably more important. Um, enough about me talking. Jason, let's talk about Jason. Um, my, my favorite fact about Jason is that his first uh, concert was Lionel Richie <laughs> in eighth grade. He went with his mom and he loves, uh, loves helping people get out of conflicts with creative problem solving. But really, more importantly, hello, is it me you're looking for? No, 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 all right, I'm done. Let's give a big hand, please, for Jason Gaddis. Okay, what's up? How many people are married here? There we go. And how many people are smarter than that? <laughs> exactly, you laugh because you know there's something a little off about us married people, right? I get it. Uh, I swore I would never get married. I swore I'd never have kids and check it out. I got two kids, been married eight years together with my beautiful wife, 12. Yep, and I get this cynicism around marriage and I also get the magnitude and power of marriage. So for the past two decades, I've been helping people, thousands of people, with their relationship problems. That's what I do for a living, all day, every day. And there's one common problem that trickles to the top, and that is after the honeymoon phase, people really get stuck. And they don't know what to do. And they really struggle. They're overwhelmed, they're underwhelmed, and they're ill-equipped for the road ahead. And uh, why is this? Why does this happen? Well, because there's a fantasy around marriage, okay? And the fantasy says that marriage equals happiness. That's the first part of the fantasy. The second part of the fantasy is if you stay married, that somehow means you're successful. Hey, congratulations. You guys have stayed married for 20 years and you're still miserable. Good job. <laughs> right? I mean, we didn't learn this stuff in school. There was no intimacy class. Right? Yet we expect ourselves to be good at it, and we're not, and then we beat ourselves up, and we subordinate to a fantasy of how we should be. So here's the other thing about the fantasy is it suggests that divorce equals failure and unhappiness. But we all know that's bullshit because we have friends who are divorced who are happy, right? Okay, so once and for all, I want to get this thing straight, okay? Let's define failure and let's define success in a relationship. And I'll use my embarrassing story as a personal example, okay? So prior to meeting my wife, I had seven failed relationships. Seven. The relationships ended, yes, but that wasn't the failure. The failure was me running away from my relationship problems and making every woman I dated wrong. That's failure. What's success in that example? Success is after the seventh failed relationship, I looked in the mirror and realized, oh, I'm the one common denominator in all these failures, huh? And I realized, oh, maybe I can do something about that. And I did, right? So 5% of the people in my experience reach a fulfilling marriage over the long haul. That's inspired, okay? They're on it and they, they, it lasts. And what happens with those successful people? What are they doing? Well, three things. I want you to remember this. The first thing is they ignore the fantasy. They're done with that. The second thing they do is they are open to change and challenge. And the third thing is they, third thing. What's that third thing, people? Oh, they're open to learning and growing. And when they don't do that, they do this. Seriously, I see it time and time again. People that don't do those three things don't make it, period and they keep their blinders on and they suffer and it's really sad, it's really intense. So the beauty, the secret here, the beauty of a marriage is your partner triggers you and pisses you off to the point where the blindfold comes off and your true colors come out. <laughs> and it gets messy, it gets ugly, it gets intense, right? But here's also the beauty, is my wife, I've shown her my worst. 
I mean my worst, right? She's seen it. And she pisses me off about it too. And she still loves me there, which helps me love myself there. So that's the power of what can happen in a long-term relationship like marriage, if people are open to this kind of stuff. And any entrepreneur gets this stuff. If you want to have a successful business, you got to grow, right? You got to learn. You got to embrace challenge or you're not going to make it. You're not going to survive. Parents also get this. Parents understand your kids probably trigger how many parents in here? Yeah, your kids can piss you off, right? They can get on nerves and, and they're so magical yet they're so intense. And if I'm not open to growing and learning, I'll shut my kids down, which is also really sad. So if you want to live inside of an inspired, fulfilled marriage over time, you got to earn it. Love is not given to you. You got to earn love every day. And when I finally realized this, and I realized that, wow, I can grow and learn about myself and embrace challenge, I knew I couldn't fail at that game, and neither can you. Sad. I really don't know how to use the mic stand. This is not me trying to extend a funny joke. I just can't do it. Um, one thing that I wanted to piggyback on, that talk was incredible, right? Um, I really thought so, too. Uh, one of the messages that I was, I was listening at the end, and he said that, you know, you need to earn love every day. I think going along with that, you need to be willing to receive love every day, and that's really important. Um, you know, relationships and shit. So... It's, it's a good deal. Um, <laughs> the next person that we have uh, coming up, by the way, I sent out an email earlier today. I'm like, if you don't want your name massacred, please spell it uh, or pronounce it to me phonetically because um, <laughs> I was going to kill this. Uh, and he wrote back, it's E-L-A-W-N, like Elon, Salami. So, uh, but Banami instead of Salami, which gets me to say it, Elon Banami. Um, <laughs> which is great, and he's fantastic. Um, he, he said that around the, the table, his family likes to share a story when he was a child and uh, decided to protest time out by pooping and throwing it at the ceiling. <laughs> I love people who can share. So let's bring out Mr. Salami. This is Elon. He wants the mic in the stand. Hi. <laughs> okay. So, why give a talk about synchronicity? Well, it was a series of events. It started with a friend asking me, what interests you? I had been reading a lot about singularity. I meant to say singularity but I accidentally said synchronicity. She said, I love synchronicity. I said, me too. <laughs> synchronicity is when things are beyond coincidence, but without explanation. Like when you've been thinking of a friend you haven't talked to in two years, and they call you that very day. I wanted to explore the possible relationship between synchronicity and self-actualization because I'm really interested in knowing myself better and I'm obsessively curious about how people come to see the world in the way they do. As I decided to write about synchronicity, I hear from Randy, who is a guy who punched me in the mouth in seventh grade. <laughs> Randy has popped in and out of my life for the last two decades. Every time we see each other, one of us is going through something significant. It gave me pause thinking about how Randy was coming in and out of my life because I couldn't quite explain our encounters, so I had two choices, dismiss or inquire. And let's be honest, if I went with dismiss, talk ends here. <laughs> I wrote out all the times I've crossed paths with Randy. Here are a few topics I write about. The time he punched me, the time he was my waiter, the time I cut hair with his brother, the time he got shot. 
I email Randy because I want to hear what he thinks. I was nervous. I mean, here I am bringing up some painful shit saying, I don't know where this is going to go. It might be relevant. It might not. If you want to share your perspective, I'm interested. The stories I had about the events reflected the way I saw the world at that time. And we give meaning to the littlest things, like that yellow circle in the corner. What reason did your mind give for its existence? You choose who you build something with, but those initial connections you have no control over. Who your parents were, who happens to crash into you in traffic, whoever's responsible for hiring that day at a job. We long for meaning, but some things are beyond our faculty. We just don't have the whole picture. That's not the human experience. I was curious about meeting Randy, but I'm clear I won't ever see the whole picture. Thinking we know or accepting our interpretation as truth puts us in a position where we're passive. It limits our ability to stay open. So consider your synchronicity story a working thesis. Ask, what is this moment asking of you, not from you? Randy and I get together for a coffee and have a conversation, our first ever. He tells me that the only time he had been to my house was at my brother's party, and that was the very night he got shot. Ultimately, I learned that Randy wasn't some angry kid who punched me in seventh grade. He was just sad and scared, like I was. So, now, there's a temptation to assume the story is over. Because if I know how things go, I don't have to live with the fear and mystery and complexity of life, the vulnerability, the angst of the unknown. But if we step back into the unknown, there's space here. Structure melts for a moment. It is only from nothingness that something new can arise. When you get a punchline, it doesn't have to be the punchline. Quantum entanglement is a physical phenomena where the actions of one particle cannot be described independently of another across any distance. I think Randy and I have some sort of entanglement, a dance that's playing itself out. So when synchronicity or entanglement shows up in your life, watch your mind form its conclusions, but then invite curiosity in. Without curiosity, Randy would have just been a bully or a victim or a waiter or whatever I labeled him. The finger pointing at the moon is not the moon, and neither is the light you see when you look up at it. What matters is that we pay attention, that we wake up and move outside of the constructs that limit our self-exploration and actualization. So the process of openness involves the elegance of holding two things at once. A, your constructs, feelings, and experience, and B, a sense of curiosity, wonder, awe. Who is your Randy? It could be a person, a place, a symbol, Write out the story of your Randy, and then settle for a moment into the inquiry. Thank you. Better. You just thanked me for telling all of you the poop story. How many of you follow us on Twitter? Just applaud, I need to hear some. Yeah, okay. How many of you saw a tweet about one of our speakers having a penis tattoo on her ankle? For those of you that didn't, surprise, our next speaker has a tattoo of a penis with wings on her ankle. If you would like to see it, feel free to hop on Twitter and go to Ignite Denver because I believe Vanessa took a picture of it during one of our workshops. Um, <laughs> and she's fantastic. We were backstage and, and uh, she told me about all of you in the front row. Where's Megan? Hey, Megan, you're awesome. <laughs> and the supportive friends in general, that's great. Um, you're going to get to hear more about her adventure here in a moment. She was backstage and she was getting nervous. She goes, okay, I got to do mountain pose. And took her shoes off and she just starts talking to me like this. I'm like, that's freaking awesome. She, she is a very unique soul, and she has a beautiful heart, and her name is Mariah. 
Please come out, Mariah. You got this. I love you. Okay, so raise your hand if your parents ever told you to eat all of your food because there's starving children in India. So we don't tend to think of the severity of a comment like that because we live in America and we're not burdened with wondering where our next meal will come from. Now imagine if this was your reality, constantly reminded of your struggles with every missed meal. That was the very situation during the 20th century in India. Now in a desperate effort to combat drought field famine, the Indian government decided to look to the apparent successes of the Green Revolution in Mexico to increase food yield through the use of genetically altered seeds and pesticides. And with the help of the American multinational Union Carbide Corporation, pesticides were brought to Indian soil. So, in 1969, began the construction of the Union Carbide Pesticide Plant. And despite potential health concerns associated with this plant being built, the people of Bhopal generally welcome this as an opportunity for jobs and also to answer their family's food insecurities. Unfortunately, due to corporate corruption and mismanagement, Union Carbide chose to overlook critical safety practices for profit. And lack of regulation by the Indian government only added an ingredient for this recipe for disaster. So, on the moonlit morning of December 3rd, 1984, a toxic gas escaped from the pesticide plant and traveled the streets, killing around 4,000 people within 24-hour period of the event. To put this in perspective, we felt the pain when we lost 3,000 Americans during the 9-11 tragedy. Within two weeks of the Bhopal event, 8,000 more had passed. And those who survived this tragedy were left with life-altering traumas such as respiratory illness, reproductive issues, and blindness. So what you don't know about is the fact that this still goes on today. The people of Bhopal are still affected by this tragedy three generations later. And to this day, children are born with impaired mental and physical ability. So in the wake of disaster, what did Union Carbide and the Indian government do? Nothing. They gave up all authority of this and relinquished any type of responsibility for this horrific disaster. But the beautiful thing about this sad story is the fact that the people of Bhopal chose to overcome. They broke down the, the traditional barriers of the caste system and gender roles and united together to address the pressing needs of their community. One outcome was the establishment of the Sambhavna Clinic in 1996. This clinic offers free health care to the survivors of the tragedy through the use of Ayurvedic practices and conventional medicine. So, January 2016, myself and the students from the Integrative Healthcare Program, which are right here supporting me tonight, and I love you guys so much, will be traveling to Bhopal, where we will be staying at the clinic, the Sambhavna Clinic, and we will be doing service learning projects for the clinic and the community. So not many students at Metro have this opportunity, with only 2% actually being able to participate in study abroad programs. So what makes this unique is the fact that we've really created this journey for ourselves. And in preparation for this journey, what we've been doing is educating ourselves about the Union Carbide disaster, raising funds through our product line, and also learning about Indian culture. At our recent charity event, the Sambhavna Gala, we raised over 18 fucking thousand dollars, which is huge! That is so huge! And that's enough money to run the Sambhavna Clinic for one whole month. So similar to the people of Bhopal, we have found this community with each, within each other and ourselves, and we've taken authority of ourselves as individuals, individuals and students. So some of you have heard of, a, of this disaster, and some of you have not. But the world's largest industrial disaster that ever happened, it's still happening. 
So what you can do is go home, have dinner tonight, or go have a beer and talk about it. Create awareness around this and help us illuminate Bhopal. Thank you. Seriously, penis butterfly on her ankle. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, what I really love about this particular iteration of Ignite is the variety of talks that we have. Um, just generally, some of them are lighthearted, some of them have a message, some of them have both. And I just think that's fascinating and that we're really fortunate that everybody is here to do this tonight. Um, including Erin McElroy. I asked her how to pronounce her name and she said it's like Macklemore but slightly different. Erin um, <laughs> appreciates the law of attraction, so this is how I'm supposed to introduce her. Erin is a National Geographic adventurer despite being purchased by Rudolph, R Rupert Murdoch. I saw that on the news today. And she's a New York Times number one best-selling author. So uh, just plant that seed. It's planted. It's out there now. And uh, she wants to visit everywhere, and she wants to do everything. And she's got a beautiful heart right there on her freaking sweater. So come on out here, Erin. <laughs> about it because we're wired to communicate and connect. We tell our stories to relate to each other, to share our own experience of life. So if stories are about life, then what can we learn about life from the patterns that we find in them? Well, esteemed author and scholar Joseph Campbell answered that. He dedicated his life to exploring the myths of cultures of all millennia, and he found a pattern. It's about the human experience and what gives it meaning, and he called it the hero's journey. And it starts with a call to adventure. Sounds cool, right? The call to adventure is a wink from the universe, what life throws at us so that we'll consider going on a journey to discover our highest potential. It's scary because it requires big change, but it's exciting because it feels possible. The call shows up as feeling stuck or wanting something more, an unexpected surprise or a big life change. And once you hear it, you cannot unhear it. It becomes like a stage five clinger. I first heard it after coming back from an epic month in South Africa. I couldn't get settled after that. When I looked at where I was going in life, I didn't really want to go there. So I thought, what if I went abroad to figure out what I really want to do? Congratulations, Hero, you are now at the threshold, AKA portal to unfamiliar territory. Immersing in unknowns <clears throat> shows us what we do know. What we know deep inside ourselves is brought to the surface by the tension of otherness that comes about when we step out of our comfort zone. So for me, the threshold was a physical border. I sold my house, my car, my stuff. I left my corporate job and I headed to Argentina. I had a three night reservation and serendipity is my compass. So now we're in the heart of things, the road of trials where anything can and does happen. Curiosity and courage are rewarded. Our hero will be tested and tempted She'll encounter her greatest fears, but she'll also find allies and teachers to help her along. This is the what was I thinking part of the journey. It is hard. We have to dig deep and remember what our vision was. This is where we find out what we are afraid of and capable of, what turns us off and what turns us on. I encountered all of these things. I made sacrifices. I felt lonely. I cried. Was this worth it? What if I don't find what I'm looking for and I'm left with nothing? What if I do find it and I don't know how to make it work? These were my fears showing up, trying to keep me small. Fears are information. They're only as strong as the energy that we feed them. And on the other side of fears is freedom. And I found that freedom by facing them, by getting to the source and choosing to not be held back. What was at stake was too great. When I climbed mountains, my heart exploded from lack of oxygen, but also for love of the challenge. I learned how to move forward when all energy seemed to be pushing against me. When I stood on the summit, I felt empowered. 
When I cycled toward the horizon, it kept moving and so did I. When I explored the jungle, I learned my approach for problems and decisions. I met artists and adventurers, seekers and dreamers. I learned what I love and why, why I'm alive. But now it's time to die. Now, don't freak out, this is a good death. Our hero is now challenged with a final test of battle or a tipping point that is akin to death in that she goes, the metamorphosis that she's been seeking in is transformed. Think butterflies. We come out of knowing our unique purpose and having everything we need to live it. We now understand that the journey has been building towards this all along. It has come full circle. In my two years in South America, I learned so much about what I love, and I love to facilitate personal transformation. I love to take photographs and use stories of adventure to inspire and influence positive change. And now it's time to share that. Now that we're truly the hero, we make the choice to return to our community and give from the place where our passions, our talents, and our experiences meet a need in the world. We're incredibly unique. There will never be another you or me ever again. And with that comes great responsibility and opportunity. And the opportunity lies where we understand how to take what we care about the most and be of service with it. And in this way, it's not selfish at all. It is necessary. The world needs you to do what you were born to do, to be the hero of your own story. So what's your story? What is your hero's journey? This is your invitation to share it. And this is your call to adventure. Thank you. I want to turn her entire presentation into a 20-month calendar. <laughs> Those pictures are incredible. Uh, <laughs> It's true, you're laughing because you agree with me. Um, we have an after party, in case I didn't mention it, along with my name, Kat, which you might have heard once or twice. Stick around, please. Uh, 88th and Wadsworth, in case anybody was curious. Uh, come on by, um, Arbor Green Townhomes. Uh, <laughs> we do have drink specials, but outside, people here who are awesome. And, uh, and we have one last speaker. And this is when creativity explodes. Um, her name is Katie Mason. She actually presented, I believe, at Ignite 19. And uh, she is brilliant. And some people think outside of the box, and some people never realize there was a box in the first place. That's Katie. Um, so she's going to come out here and talk to us. And holy crap, get ready. And then, yep, it's just, it's beautiful. So please give a big round of applause for Katie Mason. Dreams are a powerful way to uncover and release unconscious barriers while enhancing meaning and purpose. Everybody dreams and every indigenous culture on the planet honors dreams. Dreams are symbolic and metaphorical, so we must decode their messaging like we would a riddle or a puzzle. But once we have the right tools for exploration, even the most bizarre dream image has wisdom. For example, I had a dream that I was holding a Pringle coated in purple velvet. What can I do with a velvet covered Pringle? I can't eat it, it's velvet. Can't wear it either, but don't want to throw it away, it's intriguing. So what can a velvet covered Pringle teach me about my life? Well, let's take a look. When working with the dream first, uncover the emotion in the dream. And the emotion in my dream was shock, awe, curiosity, confusion. Basically, I was experiencing absurdity. Absurdity is a moment before we deconstruct meaning. It's a quality or state of being ridiculous or wildly unreasonable. To embrace absurdity is to actively engage in the unknown. And like it or not, my life has been filled with absurdity. My mother, for example, was an alcoholic, and she drank herself to death. As a kid, I could never understand that. It was incomprehensible. There was a quality of darkness to my mother's absurd behavior. And whereas my mother drowned her darkness, I, for whatever reason, learned to embrace darkness. Because darkness isn't scary if we face it. I've spent years of personal work releasing grief, sadness, anger, and professionally as a psychotherapist, that's what I help others do. 
The shadows of our lives hold transformative power, so we must befriend darkness in order to release it, to heal our losses and our wounds. So the emotion in my dream was absurdity, and my go-to reaction with the absurd is to explore its dark underside, but I just couldn't go dark on the purple Pringle. I mean, come on, it's a frickin' Pringle. So continuing to work with the image, I moved to free association. Identify the first things that come to mind when you think of the dream image. Pringles, childhood nostalgia, a surprisingly good feel considering I don't eat processed food anymore. I loved Pringles as a kid. Purple velvet, it can be fancy, but also costume-like and cheeky. Wearing all velvet is over the top, a state almost a performance in and of itself. Next, hold on to the free associations and personify the image. What would this image qualities. The only thing I could think of, a purple velvet Pringle would clearly shimmy across the stage and dance like a cartoon. <laughs> then embody the image. Imagine the image as a part of you. So I had to ask, was there ever a time in my life when I acted like a dancing velvet covered Pringle? And that's what is this. <laughs> that's me and all my glory. I remember when I was a kid, my mom would always start drinking at dinner time. So I would leave my house, dress up in coffee, and go tap dance on my neighbor's glorious tile kitchen floor during their dinner. I wouldn't ask permission, just waltz right in like I was a family meal halftime show. <laughs> Seems I knew better when I was a kid that I would never understand the dark absurdity of my mother's behavior, so I instinctively reacted with the right amount of light absurdity. For us deep thinkers dedicated to healing the darkness in our lives, embracing the light side of absurdity can be really vulnerable. But if I was going to listen to this dream, that's exactly what I needed to, to do. If the velvet-covered Pringle could speak, it would say, don't worry about the darkness right now. Just dance with me like you already know how. So this performance is dedicated to the kid in all of us who instinctively embraces life's absurdity with the right amount of lightness. Because you see, I'm a velvet covered Pringle. I'm smooth and crunchy. You like me stacked up nice. Just pop my top, make your mind drop. No, you can't stop. Whoa, he's some advice. You can never understand me, not even your metacognition can command me, because I am not meant to be consumed. It's confusing, yes, I know that life would want us all to grow by covering our favorite chip in purple velvet, but life doesn't make any goddamn sense when we are on the brink of life's brilliance. And can you really get upset with me and all my glorious absurdity when all I want to do is make you dance? Everybody give it up for Olive, Owen, Albert, Macy, and Katie. You guys take a bow. Yeah. And that is how you end a show. You guys, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Embrace your inner purple Pringles. Yeah. It blows my mind. It, it really, it, it, oh, I'm out of words. Um, kids dancing is the best, especially when covered in purple velvet. What? 88th and Wadsworth, my name is Kat Atwell. Um, we have an after party with Dan Du. Uh, it, Twitter, uh, Ignite is amazing. Submit now, buy tickets for the next one now. Drink uh, water or beer or wine. Hug people next to you or not next to you. It's awkward, but it's, yes, you kick ass. Um, 
And, and that's it for us, you guys. If you need a ride, call Lyft. We're here to help you out. Let us know as well if you need us to call them for you. Um, please stick around. We would love to meet you. Thank you so much for being part of this this evening. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Make sure she gets home all right tonight, gentlemen. Make sure he gets home all right, gal. This first song's by Dylan Johnson.
Thanks, y'all. That barn burner of a song was written by the drummer Dylan Johnson right here. And if you guys like wonky and weird jazz-influenced music, you might just like this project. Anyway, this next song we got coming up is called Don't Fret. You know, you could call it a barn burner, but you could call it a barn torture, too. Uh, this one's going to feature Ben Wyrick going ham on the, on the synthesizer. Thank you. 
tonight. Can we give it up for Eminem? Marissa Mateo! Woo! Hey, if you didn't know, we got two Mateos in the house. One who happens to be one of our best friends, and the other who happens to be a kick-ass sound guy. How about we give a hand for the sound man tonight? Yeah. yeah. Guys, thanks so much for listening to us. I know we're goofy, but, you know, we're just trying to pal around with you. Uh, we're just going to keep doing that. Yeah. Let's do Ben's song, actually. Excuse me, sometimes I get a little microphone happy. But this next one is by Ben Wyrick, who, if you haven't noticed yet, is one of the best piano players in town. What a dude.
Thank you, Double M. Wait, can we get all of the Ignite volunteers up to dance for this last one? It's going to be a quick song. It's going to be like a minute. And I just want to see you guys have a dance battle. We can flip and live tweet that. You guys will be famous. We'll be famous. No tweet. I'm kidding. We're not doing any tweeting. Get on up here, Ignite. All right, we're just going to do it. So guys, we're just going to get this groove going, and then there's a dance-off going on, but if this guy's the only one, then he wins. That's not right. And we're going to keep the grooves real nice for you. Thank you. 